So um, obviously we had a great day yesterday, and, and I'd like to add my congratulations to the organizers for putting together such a wonderful conference. If you've looked at the program, you know that we've got another really great day ahead of us. Is that so squish this way for some off. reason? Uh, I don't know what's going on. this morning from um, Michael Savio from the University of California, Davis, and the uh, title of his talk is Design, Construction, and Refinement of Gene Circuitry. So Michael. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. He said my name is Michael Savageau. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I thank the organizers too for being a part of this fantastic meeting. And uh, that, that slide that was up there before said all squeezed in the middle because the, the conference is full. And somehow this looks squeezed together. My side. I don't know if you can expand that a bit up there. But anyway, uh, I'm pleased to be here and chance to tell you a little bit about uh, some of our interests. I want to start off with this. <sighs> there we go. A uh, quote from Sidney Brenner at the announcement of the draft sequence for the human genome, and he said that the problems we faced in both the pre- and the post-genomic genetics are much the same. They all involve bridging this chasm between the genotype and the phenotype. And for many people, that chasm is filled by gene circuitry interpreted very broadly. And uh, if you ask, what, what is the function of that circuitry? You know, the superficial answer that we'd sort of all agree with is that the genotype uh, is determined by the information encoded in the DNA sequence. And the phenotype is determined by that context-dependent expression of that uh, information. And the circuitry is there to interpret the context and orchestrate appropriate responses. And uh, if you look a little deeper, of course, it's not so simple. What you find is a whole hierarchy of mechanisms between the genotype and the phenotype. And at each level in that hierarchy, you find alternative designs that raise a lot of issues. And uh, issues like, are those differences accidents that occur during evolution, and they happen to perform more or less the same function, and there's no real significance to that? Or are, are there some rules that would uh, allow you to understand those differences in design? And uh, you're all familiar with the sort of traditional approach, the reductionist approach, the bottom-up approach of characterizing the pieces of these systems, and the long-term goal would be that you'd put together an understanding of the whole system. And then with the genome technology and all of the expression array methodologies and so forth that have been spawned by that, you now have the possibility of a top-down approach where you measure lots of aspects of the phenotype and then try and in, infer what the underlying circuitry was that created those responses. And there is still uh, a third approach that I would say, which is called a middle out, or middle uh, out approach that emphasizes uh, large classes of molecular circuitry with a specific function. That is some kind of a module that, if, in ideal cases, would connect up with the, the genome information and also be a slice that would get you up to the phenotype. And uh, an example of that would be like the inducible catabolic circuits in a bacterium like E. coli, where there's roughly 100 examples of those. And so the idea is if you could find some rule that characterizes features of the design for that kind of a module, that you'd have lots of examples to test those rules. And uh, our approach has been to then uh, look at these with rigorous, well-controlled, quantitative uh, comparisons, both analytical and, and in some cases statistical, with the long-term goal that we'd like to understand why when you look at some module like this that has nearly universal design, that is the same pattern repeats over and over again, you'd like to know why. And for that, you'd like to compare with hypothetical alternatives that maybe don't exist, that were lost in evolution, to show why that particular design is, is, uh, is uh, desirable. But more often, what you find is there are alternative designs, and you're looking for a rule which would distinguish those alternatives, allow you to predict when one or the other might evolve in a given context. So that's the background. And I'd like to just spend a couple of seconds, a couple of slides, telling you a little bit about kind of the methodology we use, and then uh, basically to give you some examples of design principles uh, in these kinds of circuits that, uh, that we found over the years, and then uh, turn at the end to some construction of synthetic circuits. So uh, kind of mathematics that we've used, uh, these power law uh, equations that are a generalization of mass action, if you like, uh, 
And we've come to think of them as canonical and, and from different perspectives. One is that for the class of phenomena, which is described by uh, chemical kinetics, if you like, where these exponents would all be small integer values, this is a generalization of that and therefore is canonical for that class of phenomenon. Uh, a few years ago, we discovered that there's an enormous range of nonlinear uh, equations that can be recast globally exactly into this form. And we think of that as uh, another aspect of sort of the canonical feature of these very plastic kinds of equations. And then, of course, an analogy with linear analysis. Uh, we have local uses of these where in some uh, domain, it's an accurate representation, and that domain is larger than, than it is in a linear case because these are actually nonlinear equations. And finally, just like with piecewise linear, we can do piecewise power laws that are very easy to work with analytically. The other side of it is comparisons, which raises some very interesting questions. Uh, this is a question. Why is there something and not nothing? Uh, the Protestant theologian Paul Tillich said that his two or three year old son asked him this once and it stimulated him into some of his most productive thought. Well, that's interesting to theologians and also cosmologists and so forth, but for most biologists, a more interesting question is why is there something and not something else? And especially when there are alternatives. Why is it this particular one you find in a given organism or a given context? And I would claim that comparison is absolutely central in biology. It's central in a sense of experimental work where when you're dealing with a very complex system, the approach that's taken in dealing with that complexity is to make a change in some part of that very complex system, compare it with its isogenic uh, unchanged equivalent, and when you see some difference experimentally, you can begin to attribute it to that change that you had, that you had made. Uh, I would say it's also in the nature of evolution. That is, as soon as you have uh, a wild type and a mutant spawn in the same environment, there's a competition that gets played out in terms of uh, selection in their natural environments. And of course, optimization is a comparative approach. So we've actually spent a fair amount of time thinking about how to mathematize that kind of comparison. That is to make ideal control comparisons where you take two alternative designs, make them equivalent in every way that you can except for some feature that you're interested in. And if you do that mathematically, it sort of becomes an ideal control experiment. So that's basically the approach that we've used in a lot of our studies. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about some of the uh, design principles that, that uh, we've seen coming out of this sort of approach. And the first that I want to talk about is the crosstalk in, in the two component signal transduction modules. So this is a uh, idealized version. Uh, these two component systems are abundant in microbes, uh, also found in fungi, some plants, and so forth. Uh, this is the prototype where you have two proteins, one a sensor protein that responds uh, often to some environmental signal, and it autophosphorylates, and then it can pass that on to a response regulator protein, which uh, may be a transcription factor or whatever that causes, say, a gene change in gene expression. And, uh, there are two kinds of, of designs that are found. In one case, uh, this sensor has two functions, if you like. It can uh, pass the phosphate onto the response regulator through this reaction, but when it's unphosphorylated, it also can stimulate the dephosphorylation of the response regulator. And so we call that a bifunctional sensor, and then it has these two different functions. In this case over here, it still uh, passes the uh, phosphate onto the response regulator, but there isn't this stimulation of the desphosphorylation reactions. So these two designs are found in nature. The question is, does it make any difference? Does that little extra control in there have any influence at all? Well, when you do these careful control comparisons, in fact, you find that there is functional difference here. And the functional difference is that in the bifunctional sensor, what you find is that it tends to amplify the primary signal uh, the signal here predominantly, I didn't mention over here, but there, this can respond to other signals, small uh, energy donors over here directly to phosphorylate this, or this could be another sensor I haven't shown over here that feeds into here. But the point is in the bifunctional case, it amplifies the primary signal and tends to attenuate the secondary one. So it's as if it's designed to suppress unwanted noise from some other signal or to isolate that signal transduction cascade. On the, on the other hand, with the monofunctional sensor, it tends to attenuate the primary signal and amplify the second one such that they become more balanced. And therefore, this looks like more like an integrator that takes two different signals and, and uh, brings them together. Now, there are 
examples of each type that have had their three-dimensional structures determined. And when you look at the ATP binding domain of the bifunctional sensor, you find this undifferentiated loop here, whereas in the monofunctional sensor, you find these alpha helices. And so if you make the hypothesis that, uh, that this structure correlates with that functional difference as we found from the kinetic analysis, if you like, then uh, there are some interesting predictions that you can make by using those three-dimensional structures as templates and take the abundant uh, DNA sequence information for two component uh, systems. They're over, uh, there's more than this now, but they were at this time there were like 2,000 cases. And you can thread those, those structures and you end up with structures predicted that have either the undifferentiated loop or the alpha helices in the ATP binding domain. And so these become predictions for those two component systems to be either integrators or isolators. And uh, that's very interesting because Many of these two component systems, we have no idea what the signals are that they respond to. So uh, having some notion of whether those are integrators or isolators might help us to understand the physiology of some of those. And so we'd like to think of this as sort of high throughput uh, hypothesis generation. The second example is coupling in elementary gene circuits. And some extreme examples would be uh, case where you have these, cas these expression cascades here where you have a transcription, translation, and catalysis. And in this particular example where you have a polycystronic message which encodes a set of enzymes as well as the regulator of this system such that you have this extra feedback loop in here. And the regulator and the effector functions are perfectly coupled. On the other hand, you have a case where the regulator is in a separate transcriptional unit and synthesized constitutively so that while you induce this effector circuit, you don't really change the level of this. So these are really completely uncoupled. And again, the question is, does this make any difference? There are examples of each. Are they just accidents or can we find some rule? And uh, just to give an example of the kind of analytical comparison that we've made to get at this question, in this case, we looked at the robustness of these alternative circuits by looking at their parameter sensitivities. Now, local parameter sensitivity defined in this way. It's the change in some system property. It could be the flux through the metabolic pathway in response to some parameter and uh, uh, looking at it as a relative change. And you can do that calculation for each of those models. And then if you compare those two expressions, what you'll find is you can't make any sense of it because they have different parameters. They are a different design. It's like apples and oranges. But if you use these controlled mathematical comparisons to eliminate all the extraneous differences, you get constraints that say that some of the parameters, some of the important parameters in the uncoupled case are related to parameters in the perfectly coupled case by some constraint. So now when you calculate those two things, put in this constraint for all the uncoupled parameters, and then take the ratio to compare them, a lot of the parameters just cancel out very nicely, and you're left with something like this that's easily interpretable. In this case, all these parameters, you don't have to know what they are, but I can just say they're all positive, except for the possibility of this G12, which represents the influence of the regulator on transcription. And if that's a repressor, such as that's a negative influence, then this negative sign and the negative influence make this a positive, and so you know you're adding something to the denominator and making it larger than the numerator. So it's going to be always less than one. And the conclusion then is that the perfectly coupled system with repressor control, and that's negative, is going to be more robust than the equivalent circuit that's uncoupled. And that's a very general conclusion. It doesn't matter what the parameter values are. And many of these parameter values have never been measured in a cell, so we don't even know what they are. But this is a very general result that tells you that the robustness is better if you have perfect coupling with a repressor. But what if this is an activator and G12 is positive? Well, then you're subtracting something from the denominator, and this becomes greater than 1. So the conclusion is just the opposite. Then it says that to be uncoupled is better if you've got an activator control in a system. So it just reverses this. Uh, in fact, there's a nice experimental result a couple of years ago with the repressor systems that uh, confirm this robustness uh, property when you have uh, perfect coupling. So this is another example looking at the response time. If you have the criterion that these bacteria live in rapidly changing environments and it's an advantage to be able to respond quickly, uh, well, here in the middle is the uncoupled case. And if you add a perfectly coupled repressor, you see that it, it speeds up the response. So again, the advantage is if you're negatively regulated to have it perfectly coupled. On the other hand, if you're positively regulated and you add perfect coupling, it makes things worse. It makes it more sluggish. So again, 
there's a sort of bifurcation in the, pro in the predictions in that you expect the advantages for a repressor control system to be there if you have perfect coupling. And if you're an activator control system, you want to uncouple. And again, there's been a nice experimental confirmation of this speed up of the response with uh, uh, autogenous regulation that came out of Uri Alon's group. Well, the coupling between the effector circuit and the regulator circuit can be, in fact, more general than these extremes of perfect coupling or, or complete uncoupling. And you can have a case where you're inducing expression here. And if you look at the regulator, it can also get induced, and we call that direct coupling. They go together. Or you could repress the expression of this regulator while you're inducing this, and this is inverse coupling. And of course, the third possibility is that this doesn't change, and again, they're uncoupled. And if you go through similar kinds of analysis, you get another bifurcation in the predictions that depends on the capacity for regulation. That is the difference between the basal and the fully expressed level. If that is small and you have positive regulation, you predict inverse coupling. If it's large, you predict direct coupling. And if you have the regular uh, with a negative mode of action, it's just the reverse. There, when you have a small capacity, like say the histidine utilization system with a with a capacity of about eightfold, you expect direct coupling. Whereas if you have a large capacity, you expect inverse coupling. So when you search the literature, as we did a few years ago, and put together all the examples where people have measured the expression levels of both regulator and effector functions, and plot those in a diagram like this, here's the expression capacity for the effector genes. And uh, if you take the positive cases, which are the fill circles, these are all activator control systems that when the capacity is very low, you predict inverse coupling, and that's this case here because we're going down or repressing the regulator while you're inducing the effector function. And if it's very large capacity, and this is a log scale, very large capacity, you predict direct coupling and an increase in the regulator. And with negative mode of control, the prediction is just the, uh, the opposite. When you have a low capacity or small capacity, the negative regulation, you expect direct coupling. And if you have very high capacity, you expect, you'd expect inverse coupling. Uh, there are about 30 examples on there. We recently uh, have reviewed the literature, and there are now about twice as many that, that fit these. Uh, now, these are all done in different labs, different conditions in some respects, so that there's a lot of scatter around here. But now there are some possibilities with microarray expression experiments to try and do this in, similar, uh, in a similar context. And, and uh, we'll see additional predictions like this tested soon. So the third uh, example I want to show you is something about the mode of control. I've been talking about systems that are positively regulated or negatively regulated. And uh, there's a rule for that as well. And uh, this simply shows that you can achieve exactly the same physiological function with either mode. Uh, that is, you could have a gene that has a promoter, which is spontaneously active. And normally, it's under some restraining element, say a repressor. And the way you get induction of expression is to remove that restraining element. Alternatively, you can have a quiescent gene here with a promoter that doesn't function unless you supply some stimulus, some activator, say, that turns on expression. But in each case, in moving from the left to the right, you're inducing gene expression, but you're doing it by a different mode of control. One case negative, one case positive. And long ago, we came up with a selectionist argument that there's a rule for this, and it depends on the demand for expression of those genes, those regulated genes. And uh, so I'd like to now connect that molecular feature that has to do with uh, the molecular mechanism of control with uh, the phenotype or the, in, in the environment of this organism. And I think of E. coli, and here's your intestinal tract. And uh, you ingest E. coli all the time, and it transfers, transits through your intestinal system through here tends to colonize at the uh, distal end of the small intestine and the early part of the colon and reside there for some period of time. And then it has to recycle and colonize another host. And so its life cycle is going from what we call a high demand environment here for the lactose operon. So this is where it would be exposed to lactose. Once it reaches, at least in a lactose tolerant individual, it reaches about a third of the way into your small intestine, it would split the lactose into constituent sugars. And beyond that, you don't find very, uh, you find very little free lactose or in the environment. So E. coli is going through, the lac operon of E. coli, if you like, is going through a high demand environment where it could utilize that gene and express it, and another low demand environment where it doesn't. And if you think of that in terms of time, on the average, the time it takes to complete a cycle 
we call C, an average time in hours. And the fraction of that time in which the gene is turned on would be D, and it varies from 0 to 1. So that's how we quantify demand. D is, if it's 0, it means it's, it's in the low demand environment all the time. It's turned off, essentially. And if D were 1, it would be in the high demand environment all the time and be turned on. Well, when you put that information, all the information we know about that together, you can develop a model for what it takes to select for the elements of that control system. It has to do with the mutation rates, the, the sizes of the targets, uh, the growth rates of, of mutant and wild type populations and so forth. And when you put that all into an equation that you can actually solve, and this is the ratio of, of, say, promoter mutants to the wild type promoter. And so you can set some threshold level for that that you're willing to accept. Typically in natural populations, it's something like 1 in 10 to the 4th, 1 in 10 to the 5th. And all these alphas are parameters that have to do with that mutation rate, target size, growth rates, and so forth. And you can see that this is a function of these macroscopic parameters C and D, the cycle time on the average cycle time and the fraction that it's on. And it's a fairly complicated nonlinear expression, but you can interpret that fairly easily in terms of the asymptotic behavior. And this is what you find, that uh, you get this boundary for the, for the selection of the wild type promoter that you have to be to the right of this asymptote. And you can do the same kind of calculations for the other part of the control system, that is the interaction between operator and repressor. And you get this threshold here that you have to be to the left of that boundary. So what we're finding is in this crosshatch region, that's the region where you can realize this control system. And if you try and operate it with a demand that's outside this region or a cycle time that's outside this region, you lose the control system by genetic drift. So this is, I think, very interesting. This is what the theory says. Now, if you put in the actual numbers for the LAC operon, you get this little panel up here in the corner. And it's very close to what I just showed you, except these corners get rounded off when you actually do the calculations and not the asymptotic uh, approach. Now, there's one other interesting information, piece of information for, for this system, and that is in clinics throughout the world, they measure transit time to the, uh, lac, uh, of, uh, the lactase enzyme, and that's the test for lactose intolerance. And you find that it takes about three to four hours when you ingest the bolus of lactose to get to the uh, lactase uh, enzymes and have it split. And so if you put that in as a constant, that that's about three hours, that gives you this straight line in the green here. And you put those two things together, the region of realizability and this uh, exposure to, to lactose, and you make some interesting predictions. One is that there is a uh, fastest cycle time that you can predict, which is right there. That turns out to be about 24 hours. On the other hand, you can predict the longest cycle time. And you'll note that this is a logarithmic scale. So the longest time up here turns out to be about 70 years. That's pretty wild. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. There are a couple other things that you can get out of this. Uh, one is that that steady state I showed you uh, is what you expect under constant conditions, long term, and so forth. But if you would perturb the system by, say, throwing in a bolus of mutants, how long does it take to come back to that steady state? And that's what this is. This is the response time. And it shows that the demand is very low. It takes a long time to get back to a, a steady state. And it decreases as you increase demand until you get to this plateau. Uh, another thing you can get out of the theory is the extent of selection. That is, one over the mutant fraction in the population. And that has this sort of a peaked kind of response at some values of D here. So if you take, and these tend to be fairly close together, if you take that as some kind of an optimum and project that up to this exposure to lactose, then you get an optimum cycle time. And that turns out to be four months. Now, how do we interpret that? The fastest is sort of cycling from one host to another without colonizing. That's as fast as you can go. You might think of that as a, like a diarrheal epidemic in a nursery or something where it's going from one infant to another. And that's about as fast as it can go because that's how long it takes a bolus of food to pass through your system on average, somewhere between 8 and 48 hours. Uh, it's very widely dispersed, but on average, that's not too bad given all the assumptions that go into this. What's this long cycling time? Well, that's like colonization without cycling. And that's as if the adhesins on this strain of E. coli were so well adapted to the epithelial cells in one particular host that it never colonized another. And if it didn't get out and colonize another, it would die with that host. So it's got a cycle. That's the longest it could go is cycling before the death of the host. So that's the lifetime of the host that comes out of this. The 
average rate of recolonization is something that's been measured experimentally. Back in the 50s, there were experiments done with volunteers in the lab where they looked at their own coliforms with uh, restriction patterns. And what they found, there are two populations of E. coli. There are those transits that just zip through and you never see them again. And then there are the resident strains, which stay there for long periods of time. Long periods of time is like two months to a year. That's what they found experimentally. But eventually, even those turn over for unexplained reasons, whether it's a hot Indian dinner you had or you had an infection of some kind or whatever. But uh, two, two months to a year, and ours came four months, is in the same ballpark again. So, and I guess one other thing that comes out of that response time is that the evolutionary response time uh, for this, uh, for E. coli, the lacoperon, is about three years. So I find this kind of remarkable that looking at these conditions to select for a particular kind of molecular detail correlates and tells you something about the, the host. Well, as all you all know, the lacoperon is just not controlled by the lac repressor. There is this uh, second regulator, at least one other, the cap cyclic AMP system. And there's a logic to this such that you have to have the presence of an activator and the absence of a presser to get expression. And when you put that information together, it's a little more complicated than the previous diagram. Instead of a two-dimensional plot with C and D, now we have not only the demand for, if you like, the demand for absence of a regulator or a repressor, you also have the demand for the presence of an activator. Let me try and explain uh, these life cycle possibilities. What I'm showing you on the top here is the cycle time sort of average or normalized to unity. And this little box is the, ab this is the demand for the absence of the repressor. And then here are three different cases expressing the demand for the activator. So in one case, there's no overlap. Here's a partial overlap, and there's a complete overlap. And uh, in this panel on the left, we also have a phase difference between the presence of the activator and the absence of the repressor. And if that phase difference plus this period is less than the cycle time, you have all these possibilities. And if the sum of those two is larger than the cycle time, then you have these three possibilities. And uh, it turns out that by doing the same kinds of analysis, you now have a four-dimensional structure instead of two, but it's very similar. If you look at the response time, again, you have these decreases in a plateau, or here a minimum, a plateau. And here you have these peaked responses for the extent of selection, whether it's for the uh, demand for the presence of the activator, demand for a certain phase relationship, and a demand for the absence of repressor. And if you take those optima again and project them up, it says that this is the optimum life cycle, this one with the two different uh, periods of exposure. And this is the interpretation of that. Uh, you have this period of demand for the absence of the repressor, which is when lactose is present in the environment. But as it's going down your intestinal system, and at this point hits the lactase enzymes, you get this explosion of glucose. So here's the, uh, and here you have the presence of the, of the activator, and here you have glucose repression, and that turns off the activator function. So if you're looking at beta-galactosidase, what you'd expect is during this phase here, you have the overlap, absence of repressor, presence of activator, and it turns on. Here you take the activator away, it turns off. And because this is a flow-through system, not all of the lactose gets cleaved. And so there's a little bit of left over here, and you get a secondary burst of activity. So that's the interpretation of that two-phased expression, uh, which suggests that the lac operon in going through your system might have a pattern of expression that looks like that. So if we come back to the, another quote that Sidney made at the time, he said, there's another piece of information that's almost totally missing. It's the sequence information that specifies when, where, and for how long a gene is turned on or off. And at least in this example, what I've shown you is you're not going to find that in the sequence information alone because it's a property of the system and, in fact, the environment in which that system is, is uh, behaving. Uh, gee, i got a couple minutes. This is terrible. Uh, where do I want to go here? Uh, this is a design that worked out for an autogenously regulated repressible system that had a positive regulator years ago and had a lot of interesting kinetic properties. And the colleague of mine in, in biochemistry, Alex Ninfo, said, gee, I've got pieces that look like that. Let's put them together. So we did this. And uh, you have a design space that has all the parameters in that model in one diagram. And these are the different kinds of behaviors you can get. And 
I don't know what I did here. I talked too much. Uh, but here is the uh, positive self-regulation here on this axis. Here is the repressor feedback control. Uh, you're in the bottom right half plane. Uh, the kinetic orders are, are limited by this box for physical reasons. And these are boundaries of stability. If you cross that one, you get a, you're a switch. If you cross this one, you oscillate. And here's damped oscillations. So these are the behaviors that we know the system can exhibit. We also know if we cut the negative feedback loop and move up on that diagram, you're either going to move up to here or you can move up to here. And if you're to the right of this intersection, you're, you're going to be a switch. And so we tested that by cutting the knee and then manipulating it with IPTG. And sure enough, you get the switch. Uh, so we're somewhere to the right of this diagram in the experimental construction. Uh, but we could be anywhere in here. So we did the experiment and, uh, with the oscillator. And these were the experimental results in blue. And you can do some very crude fitting of those to the model. And that gives you a point to the right of this point, And it's somewhere in this damped oscillation. And so what we'd like to do is to move this into this region. And we know all the parameters. And we can optimize that. And there are a number of possibilities that would move you into that, cross that boundary, which means going to minus infinity in these log scales. And there are some strategies that are no good, because you never can do it. There's some the physical reasons you can't do. And so these are the ones that we're playing with. And this amounts to uh, uh, improving the, or lengthening the lifetime of the repressor message. We're trying to use some of Jay Kiesling's knotted structures to, to increase the lifetimes of those messages. Uh, well, I'd better stop here and, and uh, quickly summarize. Uh, so I've told you a little bit about the methods we use, uh, showing you some examples of design principles that we found using these approaches. In particular, uh, emphasizing the notion that to, if you're going to construct a control system, you might want to pay attention to how you're going to use that in a computation or in some other context. Because if you design it without that in mind, you may be fighting selection all the way. Whereas you might take advantage of it and have a system where you'll have selection working for you. Uh, thanks some colleagues who have worked on the comparison methodologies, the two component systems, and the uh, coupling of regulators and the construction of the oscillator. And pushing that better stop there. Thank you. OK, we have time for some questions. So someone there has a microphone for you. Isn't there sort of an implic this on? Is is there an implication that the E. coli are only uh, inhabiting humans? I mean, don't don't they move from species to species with a bunch of different life cycles and other parameters? Yeah, there there certainly are. Uh, most warm-blooded animals can have an E. coli population in them, uh, but it turns out when you look across different uh, animal species, that when you look at the cycle time for a bolus of food to go through, it's not too different, surprisingly. It's a smaller bolus in some than others, but uh, it turns out to be fairly similar. But there are other strains of E. coli which, in fact, have other habitats as well. And this is sort of the simplest, you know, looking at it as two, uh, you know, aggregating as two different environments. But you could think of other environments that, that would be more complicated life cycles. But, but even with these simplifying assumptions, you get something that, that fits with, with what you find. Okay. Got a question down front? Have you looked at the issue of how evolvable particular circuits are as opposed to how optimal they are. So do you have some general sense on whether these circuits exist in nature because you can get through them by useful functional intermediate steps versus they are the best? Uh, yeah, I guess one thing that I get out of this realizability region is that E. coli is adapted to an enormous range of possibilities that, that lack operon all the way, let's say, from a cycle time of of a day to, to 70 years, if you like. But if you ask, uh, in one sense, you might have circuits which are so robust that you can't change them, and therefore they're not very evolvable and not very useful. And there are others that, that you can evolve more easily. And we've looked a little bit this, at this a little bit in terms of switches, asking you know, how robust is a switch to changes in, in the parameters, how robust is the switching time, and so forth. And if you look at the different kinds of switches, those that are a continuous variable switch and those that are hysteretic kinds of switches, 
uh, uh, conclusions in there were that the hysteretic switches are less robust in terms of the parameters and the switching time. But what it means is that they are, they are more flexible in terms of, of moving a, a threshold. And if you think of these uh, hysteretic switches as being involved in development and differentiation, that's maybe exactly what you'd like. You'd like to be able to move those and be able to coordinate them and not have them so rigidly fixed that, that you can't change something. So there are some features that where the robustness res resides in one part of the system and not in others, and where it's not so robust is actually where you can manipulate it and move things more easily. I guess I'm partly wondering if you just got out a fresh sheet of paper and wanted a particular control system, do you ever run across a case where you say, well, maybe I would have designed it this way, some fundamentally different way, but nature might have come at a different solution because nature had to get to it in step. Well, that's what I was trying to get at with this positive or negative control. Suppose you have the ability to design an inducible switch or circuit of some kind, and you have the ability to either make it with a repressor or an activator. You have that option. But if you're thinking about how you're going to use it, if you're going to cycle very quickly and, uh, or turn it on a lot of the time, you better use an activator control rather than a repressor because that's what's going to be selected for in that, in that environment where you're using it a lot. If you use it very infrequently, you want to design it with a repressor because then selection will help you preserve that. So that's the one feature where, you, yeah, you have options. And if you look at what nature has done, when it uses a gene that's turning on and on almost all the time, it'll use an activator. And when it's off almost all the time, it'll use a repressor. We have a question at the top. So you just made a fairly firm prediction about the evolutionary behavior of an activator or a repressor. And I'm wondering if uh, you've given some thought to testing that or? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd like somebody else to test it. but <laughs> <laughs> No, but there is a partial test of that if you like. I've talked to some clinicians who do these tests for lactose intolerance. And what they find is that people who come in who are lactose intolerant, when they look at their coliforms, they tend to be lac constitutives. And that's what you'd sort of expect if you're starting to lose the negative control. Because here it was an environment, say, when they were an infant, when they had a lactase enzyme that was active. So you don't see much lactose. So the negative control is being selected and maintained. And all of a sudden now, when, that, uh, when they lose the expression of their lactase enzymes, now you change the environment. Now this flood of lactose is coming in. So now it's a high demand environment, which means positive control. And that's why you can't maintain the negative. But it has, you know, those patients, once they discover the lactose intolerance, they start changing their diet and other things. So you don't continue the experiment to see whether they would evolve a positive control for their lactoferrin. But I think you can do those experiments, those long-term selection experiments and chemostats and stuff. Okay, question on your, your left, Michael. Yeah. yeah. You can use negative control to keep something off, but you can also use negative control to uh, maintain a very tight homeostatic level. Um, and so that might have different predictions. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I didn't make that clear. Uh, I'm using positive and negative a little differently than a control engineer would. It's not negative feedback and positive feedback when I say negative and positive. This negative and positive mode is more what the molecular geneticist uses. When they think of a, so in those inducible systems, those might be both positive uh, feedback, if you like. A signal turns on the gene and it can be a feedback signal which turns on the gene, but it turns on the gene in two different ways. One is to remove the repressor and turn it on. The other is to supply the activator and turn it on. So that, uh, you're absolutely right. The negative feedback as in the homeostatic mechanism gives you different behaviors than the positive in these switches that, that we see. But the positive negativeness I've been talking about is this mode of the molecular interaction and not the, the sign of the feedback. And that was my fault. I should have made that clear from the beginning, especially talking to engineers. I'm going to use the chair's prerogative to ask the last question. <laughs> so uh, you're, in your positive and negative feedback systems, you were looking at, at rise time effects and things like that and looking for optimal selections for certain conditions. If you put stochastic fluctuations into that, and, and, and of course then you change the frequency distribution of the noise, does that change yeah. any of your conclusions at all? Uh, we haven't done a lot of that in these systems where uh, we're looking at, at the induction of, of, a, of a gene product in the natural environment. If you look at the time constants, the time constant for the rise of beta-galactosidase when you give it a step is really governed by the, the doubling time because it's the evolution of these. And so there's a long time constant there. And so we sort of look at these as integrators. You might have a lot of noise in the 
trans individual transcription events, but if you're feeding in molecules of repressor into this slowly changing pool, it sort of gets integrated out, smoothed out. So uh, we haven't paid a lot of attention to that in these kinds of systems, uh, or, and also the repressible biosynthetic systems, which are running kind of like a homeostatic device. Uh, those, I don't think, is going to make a lot of difference. They're going to get smoothed out. There are other cases where I would think that the stochastic access would be much more important. <laughs> Uh, but for the bottom line is though whether when you get some result and you go to the biology and ask whether you know those uh, tests of those ideas pan out or not. That's the, and if we find things that just don't fit, there could be lots of other reasons. Certainly, and other stochastic aspects are one of those. Great, thank you. So let's thank Michael one more time. And our next talk comes from Jim Collins from Boston University, and Jim's topic is programmable cells and synthetic gene networks. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Mike. I also want to thank Drew and the rest of the organizers for having the opportunity to talk to you all this morning. What I want to tell you about over the next 30 minutes or so is recent work that our group has done on synthetic gene networks. And what I want to focus on in particular are the applications that we've primarily been directed towards for the last couple of years. We got involved, Tim Gardner and myself, in this area just a few years ago. And the first system that we considered was a very pretty simple system, this idea of a genetic toggle switch. So shown here in schematic form, the system is basically made out of two different genes, two repressors, repressor one, repressor two. You set it up with constitutive promoters, so the promoter for each gene always wants to be on. You then go to the next step and say, okay, let's design it so that the protein product from gene one wants to bind the promoter for gene two, shutting it down, and the protein product from gene two wants to bind the promoter for gene one, shutting it down. In principle, you should be able to then set up this system so it's a bistable system, it can exist in one of two states. State one, gene one is on, gene two is off. State two, gene two is on, gene one is off. In principle, you should be able to also flip it between these different states by delivering an inducer for the currently active gene. So let's say you're in state one, you deliver an inducer that will shut down gene one, thus enabling gene two to come on. And once enough of the protein product of gene two is present to keep gene one off, you can remove the inducer. Well, we did various analyses on this, and actually Tim went as far as actually building this in E. coli, getting it to work. And what he found, given that he could actually have it behave as a bistable switch system, is that he had a simple form of cell memory. That is, you could actually have the cell remember some event by flipping into a particular state. We thought this was an interesting feature. The second interesting feature was that he had a very sharp switching threshold. With these two features, we thought, ah, oh, what could you do, use these things for? And the thing we've become quite interested in in the last couple of years is this notion of programmable cells. Could you use the toggle and other engineered gene networks as components that you could plug into cells and in some cases say interface with natural networks. So the idea here is that there are a lot of interesting signaling pathways and output pathways that exist naturally in cells and we became intrigued by this notion of ah could we maybe now couple in our cells various circuits such as the toggle switch to create cells with new functionality. So the first product that we tried was really an easy one and this is work that was done by Hideki Kobayashi, Mads Kern, and Michi Araki in our lab, was could we use the toggle switch to create a very sensitive DNA damage sensor? Uh, the field is very interested, and in, there have been a number of examples of DNA damage sensors. We thought, okay, could we actually take the toggle switch? Where I say it was easy, we said, ah, let's take a toggle switch that has the LAC I as one repressor and the wild type CI as a second repressor. When there's DNA damage in E. coli, the SOS network, the DNA damage response pathway, gets activated. When that pathway is activated, RecA gets activated. And how we made it easier on ourselves is that when RecA is activated, it'll cleave the lander repressor. So we took our LACI lander CI switch, and what we did was set it up so that you have your cells, and you set it up so that it's in the CI on state, okay, LAC off state. And what you do is couple with GFP so that CI is both repressing LAC and GFP. GFP is our readout in this case. So we set up the cells and put them in the low state or off state. And these things will stay stable for as long as your kid will look for them. So they're stable even out to 48 hours in E. coli. And then what we did was deliver small amounts 
of DNA damaging agents, whether it's mitomycin C, a uh, chemical that's actually used in chemotherapy that's known to cause DNA damage, or UV radiation. And what we find is that very low level mitomycin C, you begin to get some of the cells flipping from the off state into the on state, and more and more flip as you increase the level of mitomycin C, similar with UV radiation. As you increase the amount of UV radiation you deliver, you get more and more cells flipping from low to high state. And what's interesting about this is that this flip state is long-term stable. So after you flip it into this state, you can look out 48 hours, and it's still in that flip state. So one of the advantages here of kind of the digital logic afforded by the toggle is you could then program cells, have whole cell biosensors, that you could program to detect something in the environment that you can leave out there and interrogate at a later time. Because the toggle will afford you memory that it will remember a detection event. It doesn't have to be a DNA damage agent, it could be something else. Well, we also became intrigued by could you take this system and use it to rewire cells to do something differently. So what the team then did was, instead of using GFP as the output, they couple now the toggle to uh, TRAA gene, a gene which has been shown to produce biofilm. So in short, what we did here was create an E. coli strain that would act as a DNA damage sensor, and that as output would produce biofilm. So you start the cells basically with, in the control state, in the off state, there's no biofilm formed, and when, if you deliver either mitomycin C or UV radiation, it actually will flip on and produce biofilm. So biofilm is a community of bacteria where they basically are existing in an extra uh, polysaccharide matrix, or solid polysaccharide ma matrix, where they're attached to a surface. And the idea here is this might be a nice readout, so that you could actually have these cells form a biofilm, so you could actually maybe look from afar, or have it turn purple, and it's easy to tell if you had a detection event. What we then next did, which was more complicated, was inspired by work that Ron Weiss and Tom Knight had pioneered here at MIT, and that I think Ron will probably talk about later this morning, he and uh, Lin, Lin Chong Yu and Francis Zano have recently done, was we basically took some plasmids that Ron and Tom had developed on the basis of intracell, intracell communication using quorum sensing, where we now coupled our toggle to uh, the quorum sensing pathway from Vibro Fisheray, now moving everything into E. coli. And what we wanted to do was design a crowd sensor. That is, could you program the cells to basically detect cell density? That is, could you program the cells so that once the cells reach a certain density, they would flip and produce a protein of interest? Ron and his group have a really clever application that I think he'll talk about. Our motivation was coming from bioindustry, biotech. And that is that in various companies that use fermenters to produce cells to produce different chemicals, what they do is they allow cells to grow to a certain density and then they induce them to produce the protein of interest. Well, it turns out that these induces cost a lot of money. It's about 10 or 20% of their budget. So our thought was, ah, could you program cells to do this on their own without the need for introducing inducer? So what we did was now take the toggle, again, CI lack toggle, still having the state originally in the CI on state, lack off state. And what we now did, which is also an interesting twist, is instead of using an inducer to flip the system, so we either would cleave CI or uh, destabilize it with heat shock or induce LAC by delivering IPDG, which would get rid of it, is this time we now flipped it. And that is we've designed the system so that it would be detecting autoinducer, the small molecule that's produced as part of the quorum sensing pathway, to produce LAC I. So now we actually show that we can flip the toggle by producing the protein that's currently in the off state. Okay, so we set it up now so that LAC's co-produced part of the LUC system, and what we do is, again, have it in the CI on state, lack off state, and at low densities, it stays in the off state, and as the cells increase in density, th and thus now produce more and more lack, the toggle flips from now the low state to the high state, or the off state to the on state, and this is just a control case. Well, we were really keen on this, and on the basis of these kind of genetic circuits, we also kind of sat back very recently, and this is again work done by Hideki Mads and Michi, was kind of moving beyond synthetic gene networks and programmed cells, we began to think about programming and engineering viruses. So we actually became intrigued by one of Drew's favorite organisms, bacteria, T7. And here we actually were motivated by this challenge of how do you get rid of biofilms? So I mentioned what biofilms are, these bacteria, of bacteria, community of bacteria that are attached to a surface. They are a major problem in the environment, in industry, in medicine. They are attached to various surfaces. They're on your teeth. You find them in water pipes. Uh, they get stuck in the fermenters in terms of stuff. Anything we put in your body, 
biofilms will form. So if you have a catheter, if you have a heart valve, uh, artificial joints, biofilms are all over the place. They actually are a major source of chronic infection. They're involved in 60% of chronic infections. The big challenge is that bacteria in biofilms are incredibly resistant to antibiotics. They're about a thousand times more resistant to antibiotics than the planktonic free swimming form. So there's a real challenge. How do you get rid of them? Well, the team kind of sat back and said, ah, could we maybe modify phage? So phage is a virus that's going to infect bacteria. Okay. People have tried using phage to get rid of biofilms in the past with little success, in part because it's very difficult for them to penetrate the biofilm. Well, we kind of sat back and said, okay, could we actually design this to have a two-prong attack? That is, could you engineer phage so that they would display on the surface an active enzyme that would degrade or gobble up the matrix, the extracellular polycide matrix that the, bio, the bacteria is sitting in, that would help expose the bacterial cells for, lip, for infection from the phage, allow the phage to get in, multiply, then lyse the cells, and produce more of these biofilm busters. So we kind of thought, okay, could we make kind of like a little Keanu Reeves bacteria phage that would enter and destroy the biofilm matrix? So we designed these guys and actually got great results. So these are results after 24-hour treatment. This is untreated biofilm. If you just plunk on a bunch of cellulase, independent of the phage, you get some reduction, the order of close to 60%. If you give ampicillin, well-known antibiotic, you also get a decent amount of reduction. If you just give T7 phage, you get also a significant reduction. But if you deliver the enzymatic phage, these engineered phage, you get a dramatic reduction in the amount of biofilm. It acts pretty quickly. So that within just a few hours, you get a dramatic reduction in the amount of biofilm. You can also look at other ways to measure. I feel bad. I realized to make Fred Blattner feel more comfortable in our community, I probably shouldn't have had that exclamation point and probably toned down the enthusiasm of this slide. But these fades do work really fast. And if you actually look at now coliform, colony forming units, CFUs, which is going to measure your live cells, you really find that these engineered phage really wipe out the bacteria. And here's just a nice photo to show that, that here's the four treatment for a plate and a microfermenter, and then after where you get really clear and lack of biofilm on these plates. Okay, what do we then think about next? Well, we've been intrigued lately now also about using RNA as a regulator. So if you look in science, nature, talk to various scientists in this business, RNA is really right now the prime focus. And what's happened in our group recently is that Farron Isaacs and Dan Dwyer came up with an idea about using RNA as a regulator and specifically engineering ri riboregulators or RNA switches that could be used for post-transcriptional control of gene expression. So the gene toggle switch that Tim and I played around with a few years ago was a transcriptional control unit. And what Farron and Dan came up with was this notion of actually using RNA as a switch. So usually in prokaryotic gene expression, you'll get transcription that'll produce an mRNA. Then the ribosome will interact with the mRNA translating to produce a protein. What Farron and Dan came up with as an idea was, ah, if you could design a cis repressive sequence that you could put in front of the ribosome, it would be possible in principle to repress translation by designing it so that it would create a stem loop blocking the ribosome binding site and thus not enabling the ribosome to get on and translate the protein. Okay, that would be the first step, so you can shut down translation. The second step would be, okay, now you have low levels. Could you now turn it back on by then transcribing a short transactivating RNA sequence that would be designed to target this stem loop that when it interacts with it, opens it up, thus exposing the ribosome binding site, enabling then the ribosome to find and actually then translate the protein. So a really clever idea that Farron and Dan had, and what they did was go ahead and actually try doing this experimentally. So these are results first on the cis repression. They created various plasmids, where in this case they're using uh, GFP as the reporter. And what they did was use mFOLD to help design and predict the structures for various cis repressive sequences. Okay, and what's shown over here, this is actually the positive control, so this is now GFP without the cis repressive sequence, and then the black is autofluorescence, is it designed a bunch of different systems, CRL, CRRL, CRR7, CR10, CRB, CR12 was another one, and they got very high levels of repression shown here on the order of 96 to 98 percent repression, which is much better than what you get with various RNAi type techniques or antisensors on the order of about 75 percent. The question is what, 
could you do? Could you actually turn these guys back on? So what Farron and Dan then did was design targeted transactivating RNA sequences that were designed specifically to target the respective cis-repressive sequences for those different constructs. Okay? And what they found was that these systems were highly specific. So even though there were not very many differences, say, between CR7 and CR10, and also, say, another one, CR12, that nonetheless there were enough differences that if you design then a specific TA transactivating sequence for that cis plus blocked, that it would only activate that one. And so here are some results shown for the CR10. What you have is now this is, again, a positive control. Here's autofluorescence. This is, in this case, the repressed case, the repressed state. And then this is the level of activation. So here it's just a cis sequence with the cis message. And then when they deliver the transactivating, they can get, we found they could get anywhere from 5 to 20-fold activation over the repressed level. Next plot is... Uh, just showing some of the predicted M-fold structures, in this case for the TAR12 sequence, as well as the CRR12 sequence, and then their interaction. Uh, various transient response, Farron and Dan found that they could actually detect activation, in this case using GFP, after five minutes, and the system took on the order of about 70 minutes to reach the full state, and we think that much of that time is due to the maturation needs for GFP. Again, for state state response anywhere, this is now showing you can actually tune the system to get inducible control of expression going from very low levels up to relatively high levels, in this case, getting five to tenfold increase. As well, as I already mentioned, that we found it was highly specific. That is, the TAR10 sequence only would activate the respective cis-repressed sequence, and similarly with 12 and 12. The nice thing about this, which isn't captured on these slides, is this thing works with any gene. You can plug this in front of any gene of interest. It works with any promoter. So the guys are now doing several different applications for this. One is they have already incorporated into a genetic circuit as an additional level of control. Two is, uh, Dan in particular is exploring utilizing this with promoters that can be activated by various analytes in the environment as part of a sensor unit. He's also using it now to actually control the expression of toxic genes. There are a number of toxic genes which have been very difficult to study in bacteria because even at low levels of expression, they either kill the cells or stop them from growing. And Dan's been able to show that even with very highly toxic genes, he can, with this fine control, have the cells grow and then actually turn them on to see what happens. And we're now beginning to explore what pathways are being activated as a result of these toxic genes. One of the things we hope to do is actually try to also couple these units with some of the beautiful stuff that Ham Halinga talked about yesterday, as well as Wendell Lim, to maybe look at some of the engineered proteins and receptors that their groups are looking at to see if you could develop very sensitive, specific sensors. How are we doing on time? <coughs> Still green? Oh, great. OK. So what I want to go on to next is another level of application that we became intrigued by. And now this goes back again about a couple years ago. So Tim and I began to think about, well, what could you use some of these switches for? And really, this is a slide that kind of captures, say, the intersection of synthetic biology with systems biology. And we became intrigued as an application of, could you use some of these engineered switches as means to probe natural networks? So that is, could you have, say, the toggle switch or some other inducible switch, go in, put it into a cell, and use it to turn up or down genes or proteins of interest, measure the response, and from that, perhaps, infer the underlying network structure. So one of the real challenges that we have, and where I think synthetic biology can make a contribution, is to begin to uncover the underlying structure of actual net natural networks. And synthetic biology has a lot to offer, both in terms of also testing some of the models and structures that are being proposed, as well as providing a set of tools for the probing. Well, with this idea, which is kind of just classic notion of reverse engineering, what Tim and I did with Diego DiBernardo and David Lorenz in our group was we started out kind of easy. So, okay, let's do an experimental study where we're going to look at a sub-network of a pretty well-studied system. And what we focused on was the SOS pathway, the same one that we coupled as part of our DNA damage sensor, in E. coli. This is, again, the system that gets activated in the face of DNA damage. It involves anywhere from 100 to 160 genes. We made it easy on ourselves. We said, oh, let's just look at a nine-gene subnetwork of this system that includes some of the key regulators uh, that would enable us to come up with something that might be interesting as well as something that could be nonetheless simple enough to analyze and manage. So what we did as part of a protocol was develop a integrated computational experimental approach. We went in now with switches. In this case, we didn't use the toggle. We didn't need to. We just used inducible switches 
what we did was create inducible plasmids that enabled us to overexpress in turn each of the nine genes making up the network. We overexpress them and then measure steady state response to the cell six hours out. We use poor man microarray, we use uh, qPCR. Okay. We took those data and then process it with an algorithm that we developed to actually refer or inf infer the underlying network structure. And this enabled us to pull out a quantitative network. What does some of the data look like? So what's shown here is the top are the results of, say, the LexA perturbation. If you overexpress LexA and then look out six hours later, what happens? LexA is still high, up-regulated. The other eight genes are down-regulated. And that's this line here in this kind of pseudo microarray plot. And these are the results from our eight other perturbations, including the ninth LexA perturbation. What do we do? We took these data and process it with our reverse engineering algorithm, which we refer to as the NIR, Network Inference by Multiple Regression. And what we did was keep it pretty simple. Just did a first order approximation for this analysis. Where we said, ah, let's just fit a linear model to the data. And our goal here is can we actually determine the coefficients in the connectivity matrix making up the model? Okay, we did various assumptions, used various kind of standard techniques, one of the key Assumptions we made is we actually limited the number of inputs to each gene, varying it from anywhere from four to six for each of the nine genes. And using this approach, we were able to, by applying looking at real data, was actually pull out a quantitative network model for the underlying nine genes. So as shown on the left, or the nine genes, I'm actually showing an undirected graph. Uh, but on the right, it's actually showing the, the strength of the connection that we found between the respective genes and the sign, negative obviously being repression positive is activation. Shown in blue is that we actually confirmed many of the previous reported connections. Now this system really hadn't been studied from a systems biology or synthetic biology standpoint, but much of it had been studied in some depth. And in red we found a number of new connections or false positives. So we say new, we don't know if they're new, they might be new and real, or they just may be a result of these data are noisy and we're just not so sure. Okay, that's nice. You know, I know uh, Roger Brent charged us yesterday to talk about applications. Well, this is nice. You can make a nice cover on a journal for this and you've got your quantitative values. Uh, but what could you use this for? Well, we kind of scratched our heads and came up with two applications. The first, I don't think is as important as the second. But the first was you can actually drive the model to identify what are your key regulators in your system. So if you take this quantitative network model and now drive it, what you find is that the model predicts that both RecA and LexA are the two major regulators as part of this nine gene subnetwork. Now it turns out those are the two key regulators, so that was a nice validation for this quantitative network model that we pulled out, as also you pick up Rec A is shown as being about twice as influential as Lex A. This gives you some insight, say particularly if it's a pathway that you don't know about, where you might want to intervene to have, say, some phenotypic consequence or maybe some drug effect. That's nice, and we've actually shown in our lab recently that that actually has some value. But I think the real value for this kind of synthetic systems approach is in a different application, and that is identifying compound mode of action. So it turns out drug companies, biotech companies, are really good at setting up assays to tell you, did their drug of interest hit the target of interest? Really good. They're pros. They can't tell you what else did that drug hit. So you drop your compound on a cell, you've got thousands of cells, thousands of genes or proteins to worry about. It's very difficult to tell you what else did this thing hit. And these so-called off-target effects are major problems. They can lead to toxic effects, side effects. What we realized is that what you could do is potentially take our quantitative network model and apply it to the output of an expression profile to predict what was the input. That is, you, to predict what were the mediators or the action of the compound that you applied. So again, the simple idea is from a system standpoint, you've got three parts to a system. You got the input, you got the output, and the system itself. If you know two of the three, you should be able to work out the third. So we actually work out our quantitative network model by putting in a bunch of inputs, knowing what we're putting in, measuring the outputs, getting suitable coverage, boom, we can pull out the network. Now, if you give me a drug, I drop it on the cells, and I don't know what the input is into the network, where this thing is hitting, but I have the output. If I have the system model and it's good, I should be able to apply it to the output to predict, ah, where did the drug interact? Or what were the mediators of the drug on that network? So motivated by that, what we did were a couple cute experiments. One was kind of a genetic version of a compound effect. So we created a plasmid that enabled us to overexpress Rec A and Lex A simultaneously. Okay? So we overexpressed these two key regulators, boom. What happens? Well, this is the steady state output of the system. 
what happens is that five of the nine genes change significantly. Three of them are upregulated, two are downregulated. Two of the ones that are upregulated are both Rec A and Lex A. If I give this to you and say, okay, what did I do to create that pattern? Well, you could take a guess, but it'd be difficult for you to come up with the right answer. We take this as output, apply it to our quantitative network model to predict what was the input that led to that. And what it says is that both Rec A and Lex A were significantly upregulated to produce this output, which is in fact what we did genetically. So we then made it a little harder on ourselves and said, okay, what happens if you drop a chemical on these cells? Obviously, this would be a lot easier if I used PowerPoint, wouldn't it? That what happens? So you, you drop mitomycin C on these cells. So here's a DNA damaging agent. And what happens? Boom! All nine genes go up. <laughs> now I get a scene and say, okay, what happened to produce this? Well, good luck trying to guess what would happen. But you take this as output and process it with the quantitative network model. And what it predicts is that Rec A was significantly upregulated and that UMUDC. Well, it turns out, as already mentioned at the outset for our DNA damage sensor, Rec A is the known mediator for the SOS network. It's the thing that gets activated, turns everybody else on. If you look, we actually reported on this work in Science Lash. If you look at the paper, we say UMUDC is either indication of some alternative pathway being activated or a false positive. Since saying that, Skip Scheimer, CEO of Celicon, and uh, Graham Walker here, a UMUDC expert, have contacted us independently. and said, no, 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 no. It's probably some other interesting pathway for UMUDC itself, given that it's a translesion repair polymerase. And in fact, we're meeting with Graham on Monday to talk further about what might be going on here. So just to finish off on my last results slide, and it is my last results slide, is what happens if you apply some, some other data. So what we did was actually get data from George Church's lab that he had published. And what we did was apply our quantitative network model to data that he had obtained separately for various treatments, UV radiation, bifloxacin, and novobiocin. So what you see, these are our results for mitomycin C. And then here are the results for UV radiation, which are making similar predictions to the mediation that both Rec A and UMUDC. Pafloxacin, which is a drug that causes DNA damage, the prediction in this is interesting is it does pick up RECI, but it doesn't pick up UMUDC. So it's possible that this quinolone is actually mediating DNA damage or doing something differently to the cell than these other DNA damaging agents. And just as a sanity check, novobiocin, which doesn't cause any DNA damage, is actually predicted not to have caused any DNA damage in terms of activating the SOS network. So where are we going? Well, I think I'll just end on noting that uh, we actually are participating in this synthetic biology um, jamboree that Drew and Randy and Tom and Jerry have organized. And our group is pretty excited to learn more about it and figure out what we can do. But one of the things we're beginning to think about is can you actually design networks that are counters? This is inspired in part by some comments that Tom had made, Tom Knight, in an earlier writing of his. You know, could you design cells or a network that could count events, either detection events or perhaps cell cycle events? so that you could, say, program a cell that it would only exist for, say, five life cycles or ten life cycles and then die. Well, anyways, I'll end there and uh, open up for any questions. Okay, we have lots of time for questions. So, over here. Okay, let's go here first, then. And... Uh, Jim, can you comment on the last piece of this, to what extent you think the quantitative approach is enabling versus the network reverse engineering? And to what extent, if you go from a sub-network to a whole network, you, p you think you can maintain the quantitative nature of the predictions? Uh, there are many other approaches to qualitatively predict what's influencing what right. without regard to the degree. Uh, and I guess the final thing is, how unique are these kind of predictions on the quantitative side? Are there many possible change levels that could explain the data, or are you always finding one unique solution? Yeah, those are good questions. Uh, our compound mode of action relies entirely on the quantitative nature of the networks for the approach we've taken. In terms of extending it to larger networks, we currently are now actually do, launching a study in our lab to look at the full SOS network. So we've moved to microarrays, and we're actually going to be overexpressing on the order of about 100 different genes and doing array profiling in each of those experiments. Second is that we've developed a related technique, which I have slides for, but I, I guess I lost completely track of time if I have a lot of time, but that where we did on actually large scale expression profiles. So in fact, we look at the Rosetta data and can actually create metagene networks of the order of 50 genes to 100 genes, and in fact, make great predictions for the drug compounds that they have in their data set as well as the overexpression. So we do think that the approach is scalable, 
albeit issues of noise, in this case, experimental noise, and not, say, the biological noise that Michael will tell us about later this morning. Uh, your last question was, what was your last question again? Is, are you finding unique? Oh, are we finding unique? Uh, no, you know, we're finding, what we're presenting are the best, res the best predictions on the basis of pretty, pretty strict statistics that are being applied. There are others that can fit. What's interesting, though, is that we're finding that these, these results are relatively robust. And so we can actually use less data than we did, say, for the original E. coli system, and actually get similar predictions on the end. And that's nice. You know, I think in the end, these systems tend to be pretty heavily damped, the regulatory networks. And as a result, I think there is a fair amount of slop in what, you're gonna, what you can do. We're really challenged, though, right now by the noise that exists in the experimental data. Got a question on your left, Jim? What was the purpose of the what was the purpose of the stem loop in the transactivating RNA? Uh, the stem loop was in part actually the thing that we could then target to open up. So it was actually instability that was that was introduced that allowed actually us to have the TA structure go in and open the deal up. No, the the, the in the TA though. Oh, in the TA. Uh, actually, I have Farron here. Farron. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Question up at the top right. I was just wondering, did you try designing experiments to test the linearity assumption of the model? Uh, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't designed experiments to test it, per se. Uh, you know, I guess our, our justification on using it was we, did, we had looked at, say, induction curves to show that we were getting some linear response that was fair. Two is that I guess our, our interest is really not to pull out an underlying quantitative network model that is necessarily representative of the true connections, because we're really looking at a functional network. And so our true test of the various assumptions we put in the system were the predictions that we can make on both driving it to get the correct principal regulators, and two, getting the compound mode of action correctly identified. But the linearity, it's an interesting assumption. We are, Tim Gardner's group in particular, is actually looking to now extend to include some nonlinearities. But we at least found for these studies, as well as the Rosetta studies that we did for much larger networks, that the linearity assumption was pretty good. You know, we, and we, are, we obviously all realize that there are nonlinearities in the systems, but sometimes nonlinearities aren't necessarily going to be important, particularly at least in steady state for the cases that we've been looking at. Um. Uh, I Mike, uh, oh, sorry. So I guess I have two related questions, and one was sort of partly raised by Maya, which is, let me ask the first one first, actually. A lot of your control systems seem very kind of digital. Like, if this happens, then do this, turn this on. If this doesn't happen, turn this off. And actually, the cell is an analog function of the concentration and the binding. So are you not doing more sophisticated analog control because of Ex your experimental inability to do so? Or why is it that we see so much of this switching and stuff when the cell is actually this analog control system? Why aren't we regulating things with PID control, for example? Uh, so I, I guess, uh, you know, our, our motivation for getting into it was uh, not so much to mimic what a network did in the cell. So I think our, our, we went in thinking, could you get a system that had interesting dynamics, and in this case, actually, so to start on the toggle, nonlinear dynamics right. that could be designed and exploited. PID control, I'm not going to get interesting nonlinear dynamics. I'm going to get interesting dynamics, but No, no, but you're actually dynamics. inconsistent, because in the second part, you're actually exploiting the fact that it's linear and analog, and you make this linear model of what the cell is actually doing, and then you do inverse least squares to infer what the linear model of the cell is. Yeah. And yet, when you actually control it, you pretend it's this bang-bang control when, for example, you're trying to do density expression. You know, you want to, let's say for, in a control system, the way you evaluate whether it's good or not is you see how close to the target did it get, and the closer to the target it gets, the more likely it's to oscillate if you do the control badly. So what I'm asking is, it seems to me like the cell is a very rich plant, as a control engineer would say, 
where you can do really sophisticated forms of control that are well known in control theory. So why is it that talk after talk after talk, I see these stupid digital control schemes, <laughs> which are kind of like bang, bang, control. I mean, that, those are called sigma delta control schemes in control engineering. And, and you know, control engineers do use them. Yeah. But we've learned a lot about how not to control systems and sort of control them in a more analog way, a yeah. softer way that gives them nicer limits. And the cell's a beautiful plan to do it. So my question is, is this an experimental issue, meaning it's hard to do? Or is it just that we are so corrupted by digital computation that we've forgotten how to do analog control? Yeah, so, so uh, I guess a couple things. One is, yeah, I guess I am conflicted. I go home conflicted at night because one half of our lab does nonlinear circuit design. The other does linear inference modeling for natural networks. So, you know, the, the I guess, stupidity charge or kind of motivation of why we've been stupid and, and done toggle. No, I'm, toggle not, I'm not, I didn't mean is, to say that. No, I, just, I know, I know, but you said it. So, but, but, so. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> is, is that from a sensor standpoint, so really, you know, when we look about, say, programmable cells in this, we're using these circuits from a sensor standpoint on the front end. And from sensors, you do want to have tight control. That is, you want to get specificity yeah. in this case for you don't want to have it recording, you know, have a high number of false positives. So that you want it so that only when your analyte or your cell density or chemicals reach a certain point, boom, that you flip it on. There is one application where the digital type control could work. Two would be that there are a lot of situations on the medical side where you would only want the gene expressed under certain situations. And you wouldn't want this nice continuous analog type control, such as in, say, various gene therapy or cell therapy standpoints. And that was one of our original application motivations for the genetic toggle search. That is, could you really keep it off? under certain situations, such as if the patient is responding very badly to the therapeutic gene. And could you turn it on with just a flip without the need for the presence of a continual chemical to flip it from the off to the on state? And if for that, you would need this bind stability and this sharp digital control. In terms of analog control, you know, for various other applications, sure, they're, 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 we have systems such as various inducible plasmids that will give you this analog response that you could incorporate for different applications. And I think there will be some good applications. We've just been motivated for these, and that's why we chose those. Okay, going to take the last question. I'd like to respond to Raul over there. Okay, this, I would like to say that as an engineer, we have a choice of how to use a component. It depends, uh, the choice is a, indeed you start with something that may be an analog device, and almost all real objects are analog devices unless we look at the quantum level. And then we choose to make them digital when we want to suppress noise and have lots of, lots of stages of processing. We use analog when we have a few stages of processing and we don't have a, a noise problem. The difficulty, with, the difficulty here is, is that when we start out, cells are very noisy. Okay? And we, so the first, easiest things to do to start out is to make digital systems. That's later, not later okay, we may learn how to do better. But the other thing I want to say, and, and, but I want to say something else about that too. Okay, it is our choice. It is not something that we're that we're being forced on from the world. Although we do find that many biological systems have digital components in them. Oh, I agree with that. But it's like you said, you start digital because it's the simplest thing to do. But if you design a high loop gain analog circuit, an analog feedback loop attenuates noise at the output. It doesn't attenuate input referred noise. So that's why you, in fact, build analog systems with feedback control. That's why all analog systems that work okay, have feedback well, I, control. I, I think gotta, we should meet I, him outside. Yeah, I think this would be a great topic to discuss in the break, which <laughs> comes to some moment. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's thank Jim again. Okay, so our next talk, this is a student talk, and uh, the topic is gene network engineering in mammalian cells, and Biot Kramer from, is here today from Zurich to uh, present this talk.